I'll show you. Spit dick. Here it is. Born and raised in Amsterdam, a little girl who had a dream. I watched Muhammad Ali at seven years old and I pointed at the TV and I said, that's what I'm gonna do, and everybody laughed at me. Many years later, in 1998, I met him. He was my hero. He was not just a great athlete, he was a humanitarian. He cared for people. I care for people. My mantra is, share with the world what you have in abundance, whatever that is. Fame, money, whatever gifts you have in abundance, share it with the world. I'm very grateful that I'm here today. I was that girl with a dream. And thanks to all of you, all of you, because there's people from my past here, and some people, this is the first time I put the name with the face. Um, all of you, thank you so much, because all the men in boxing that supported me, that trained me, that believed in me, all the reporters that wrote about me, all the fans that cheered me on, all the trainers that trained me, all the way back to my kickboxing career. I have a total of 54 in all. And most of my discipline and focus I got from the martial arts. And then when I flew to America, to Los Angeles, with a suitcase of clothing, I was able to live the American dream. And it was a bumpy ride. There were times I had no fights. There were times I had no money. I didn't know how to pay my rent. But I kept believing with a mantra and a song that a lady once wrote for me. And it's like, Lucia Riker, there's no one like her. Beauty and power, strength and grace. She can pack a punch but don't get in her face. Protected by angels, she's a bringer of light. So watch out world, she's gonna knock you out. She's not a redhead, but wait and see. The whole world's gonna shout, I love Lucy. Thank you so much. These are invited into the Hall of Fame in three categories. Non-participants, observers, and modern category. We'll begin with our non-participants, as defined, men and women who have made contributions to the sport apart from the roles as boxers or observers, based upon a candidate's achievements and contributions in their particular field. We begin with one of the great roles in boxing that makes boxing so exciting is the role of a matchmaker. And so today, and at this point, we honor Brad Goodman. Oh, no, Brad, I have a few things to say. <laughs> Listen, he, you know, he, he looks young and he is young, but you look at the breadth of his experience and what he has done, and you think he's an old, old man. He has done so much for the sport of boxing through his career and still in the prime of his career. Born in Queens, New York, he is one of the busiest and most well regarded matchmakers in boxing world today. He became enthralled with boxing as a teenager after seeing the Muhammad Ali versus Ernie Shavers fight in 1977, the heavyweight world championship at Madison Square Garden. As a team, he apprenticed under some of the best. Top ranked matchmakers Teddy Brenner and Bruce Trampler attending fights along the East Coast to learn the craft. He ultimately followed in their great legendary footsteps over the course of a nearly 40 year career and has built a reputation as one of the most knowledgeable and respected matchmakers in the sport. He continues to scout amateur and professional <laughs> prospects with his keen eye for top rank incorporated and then expertly match them to maximize their exposure and experience. In the non-participant category, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the newest International Boxing Hall of Famer, Brad Goodman. Jeez. It's, uh, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, first, first, I want to thank you guys out there and the fans 
for making this happen. It's, it's not about me, it's about you guys. So, God bless you. Uh, I said it before and I'm going to say it again. Ed and his family, you know, I just want to thank them for, you know, making this thing happen. Uh, and all the people, the wonderful people in Verona and Canastota uh, for making this great event. This moment, it's dedicated to my parents who are smiling down on me because the app is so happy I'm receiving this special honor. I salute all the previous Hall of Famers, many who are here today, and fellow 2023 inductees, including top-ranked COO Brad Jacobs, who deserves this award just for listening to my occasional moments of insanity. <laughs> I have so much respect for you, Brad. And former top ranked world champion, Timothy Bradley. Thank you. So it all started 40 years ago. Bob Aaron, he gave me a chance to work in boxing. Bob was only 51 back then. And today I get to thank Mr. Aaron and his family, including Lovey. Todd DeBuff and Dina DeBuff Roth. My thanks to, to previous top ranked Hall of Famers, including Bob Aram, Irving Rudd, Teddy Brenner, Lee Samuels, and Bruce Trampler, who gave me the chance of a lifetime to fulfill my dreams. He believed in me, and I owe everything to him. And these people I've worked with in no special order, except that they're special to me. Ron Katz, Johnny Boz, Russell and Linda Peltz, Carl Moretti, Jeremy Kogel, Mackenzie and Mary Joe Kramer, <clears throat> Zalmara Martinez. Some more important people in my career have been Emmanuel Stewart, Bob Yellen, Samson Lukowitz, Rudy Hernandez, Mark Ratner, Louis DeCoupis Jr., Robert and Mikey Garcia, and their father, Don Eduardo Garcia, Jim Smitty Smith and Steve Mestis in Denver, Tom Brown, the great Jimmy Glenn, who, in my opinion, was the kindest man in boxing, James Prince, Antonio Leonard, David McWhorter, Frank Espinosa, Armando Velardez and his family, Alex Campanova, Bruce the Yankee Guy, Rick Meridian, Dan Raphael, Barbara Barrios, Larry Hazard, I can't forget Angie Jackson, Pete Susans, Ubaldo Soto, Miguel Diaz, Iran Barkley, Miguel Cotto, Brian Perez, Hector Soto, Ivan Calderon, Kevin Ioli, Mike Alvarado, Pat Lynch, Lou DiBella, Rick Glazer, Tony Tolge and Angelo Hyder out in Australia, Henry Ramirez, Patrick Nascimento, Steve Bash, Tutiko Zabala, Bill and Bobby Benton, Don Sharkin, Sam Garcia, and his mom and dad, Kathy and Max. And thanks to three men, I hope to get inducted for their contributions to boxing. <clears throat> Alex Wallow, Don Majeski, and Sean Gibbons. The hardest work, the hardest working and smartest boxing mind in boxing. Again, Ed, thanks again. It's been first class all week. 
and see you on the crew. One last thing. When people ask me what was the best match that I ever made, she's sitting with me today and for the rest of my life. For 12 years, he was a senior programming consultant for many of our favorites, the USA Network Tuesday Night Fights weekly series. In 2010, he had been the chief operating officer of Top Rank, where he oversees productions of 30 plus global events every year. He expertly orchestrated the plan for boxing's return from the COVID-19 pandemic with Top Rank Bubble in Las Vegas, Nevada, coordinating countless logistics with all parties to ensure safety for a multitude of weekly cards. Well respected for being such a straight shooter in this sometimes not so straight world of boxing, he is known for his expertise in negotiating fees and rights, venue locations, advertising, sponsorship, and organization, and his communication strengths are beyond reproach. Truly an exceptional man and deserving of this honor, congratulations to the newest inductee into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in the non-participant category, Brad Jacobs. Fighters and fans alike. 
I've always believed that boxing, like all professional sports, deserves the utmost respect and professionalism in my dedicated my career to upholding those values. <clears throat> Having said that, I cannot take credit for any of this alone. I am deeply indebted to countless individuals who have supported me on this journey. There are so many people that touch your life along the way, and of course, there are too many to mention here. Many of them Brad has already mentioned uh, <clears throat> in his terrific list. But I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to highlight some of those people who have been instrumental in my career. I'm forever in debt to Coach Nan Peterson of the University of South Florida, Phil Alessi and Ken Rosenberg from Alessi Promotions, legendary Mickey Duff who took me under his wing as a little pup, uh, Rob Curie, Gordon Beck at USA Network, the incredible fellow Hall of Famer Roy Jones Jr., and of course Todd LaBeouf and Bob Arum of Top Rank. Uh, I've spent the last 14 years staging events for top rank, most incredible venues anywhere, Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, Cowboy Stadium, monster events in Australia, China, and the UK, and many other points across the globe. Um, and like was already mentioned, I, I'm most proud actually of the return to boxing that we made uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, and that took a huge effort by a lot of people, many of them are here today, uh, and you know I really count that as a special moment. In the end, none of this is possible without the courageous boxers who have placed their trust in all of us here today, and thank you for being allowing me to be a small part of your incredible careers. I'd like to take this moment to recognize my current, uh, many current colleagues and friends at Top Rank and ESPN with a uh, sort of travel the world with almost on a weekly basis. Uh, and it's a terrific team that includes today's Hall of Fame inductees, the great Tim Bradley and the incredible matchmaker Brad Goodman. <laughs> in, in addition to previous top ranked Hall of Fame inductees, Mr. Bob Aaron, Bruce Trapper, Lee Samuels, Teddy Brenner, and Irvin Rudd, and on the broadcast side, ESPN <laughs> Hall of Famer Andre Ward. Special thanks goes to my top ranked family who made their way here today after the late night last night in Madison Square Garden. In closing, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to my amazing family who have been the most important part of this journey. I'm so happy that we're joined here today by the loves of my life, my son Alex, his bride to be Bella, my two amazing daughters, Lexi and Lindsay. Their support and patience along that, the way, and that of their mom, Laura, made this all possible. Additionally, I'm joined by my lifelong best friend, Rob Rubin, who is here to celebrate the significant day. Finally, thank you, Ed Brophy and the International Boxing Hall of Fame. It's a wild and crazy business, and I wouldn't have any other way. Thank you. Inductee is from California's San Fernando Valley. I'm speaking of Joe Goosen. Yeah. One of the ten siblings from the world famous Goosen family, he trained boxers out of the famed family run Ted Goose Boxing Gym in Van Nuys, California. He guided great world champions such as Michael Second to None, brothers Gabriel and Rafael Ruelas, Frankie Niles, Joel Casamayor, Shane Mosley, and Riddick Bowe. In 1988, he was named Trainer of the Year by KO Magazine, and in 2005, he was in the Diego Corrales Corner for that remarkable lightweight title, Fight of the Year win over Jose Luis Castillo. Still an in-demand trainer, he has worked with Ryan Garcia and Frank Sanchez most recently, along with many others. Outside of the ring, he has found success as a highly respected broadcaster imparting his knowledge to viewers as a Fox Sports analyst for Premier Boxing Champions. Congratulations, we welcome to the International Boxing Hall of Fame in the non-participant category, Joe Goosen. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks. So. Yeah, we go back a long way, right? Not forever. Yeah, I used to watch your dad at the old Olympic Auditorium when I first started going to fights back in the early 70s. He was a wonderful man. Uh, and you're just like that. So, 
Uh, you know, last night we had a lot of fun when we enjoyed ourselves and told some good, fun stories. And today is a little bit more serious. Um, and that's why I'd like to just reflect, if I might, for a minute on uh, my brother Dan. He's, uh, you know, he's in the Hall of Fame as well. He went in a couple of years ago. And Dan was really an incredible person. Um, he, if it weren't for Dan, I wouldn't be standing here today. That's a fact. Um, I was involved with Randy Shields from like 1970 to 81. And Dan went to a fight in Chicago where Randy fought a kid named Louis Kale Mateo and Bob. Here, where's Bob? Bob? You were there. No. Uh, Akbar Muhammad was there. And uh, he was your vice president. And Sonny Shields, Randy's dad, and Akbar couldn't come to an agreement. And Dan was not in the boxing business at the time, but he was a good salesman. I think you. You'd admit that, right? So Dan went in and talked to Akbar within five minutes. They had made a deal. We went out that night, by the way. And that was kind of a, our first foray into the business together. And um, eventually, a couple years later, we started, or that was 1979, we started our own business. We opened up in LA. With, you know, we were in an empty lot, basically, playing wiffle ball on the weekends, having barbecues. And um, an old trainer came by, and he'd bring some of the inner city kids in, because they had never really been to the valley, um, been to a barbecue. And um, it was L.C. Morgan. I, I think you remember L.C. Morgan. Anyway, L.C. brought out a bunch of kids, and he'd bring his mitts, and he'd work the kids out in the empty lot, and we'd have barbecues, like I said, wiffle ball games, we're having a great time. And uh, he said, you know, wouldn't it be something if, you know, LC said this to Dan, wouldn't it be something if we had a ring here where we could have the kids come in and do the mints or something? Well, the next weekend, LC pulls up to the next barbecue, uh, which we had almost every weekend, and Dan had his buddy, who was a carpenter, build a damn ring. And it was amazing. And L.C. Morgan got out of the van with about six or seven kids, and he literally broke down. He couldn't believe it. And uh, but that was Dan. He got things done. And he he listened to what L.C. had said. L.C. probably thought he wasn't paying attention. We had a damn ring built there the next weekend. It kind of ruined our wiffle ball field, but uh, that was where we started. And of course. In 1984, just three years later, we signed Michael Nunn, the great Michael Nunn. He was an incredible fighter. And uh, thank you. And of course, Dan took him to the best promoter in the world, and that was Bob Aaron at the time. Absolutely. And Bob still is. And of course, uh, Bob signed most of our guys that were, you know, good enough to make it, uh, you know, with his company. I was including the Gabriel and Rafael Rellis, Michael Nunn, and we had a great, great run. And Bob was always great to us. He was a good, he's a good man, and he, he treated us very well. And that really gave us our start in this game. And he, he got Nunn all the way to the world title, which we won at Caesar's Palace in '88. Knocked out Frank Tate, the gold medal winner, who had beaten Nunn in the Olympics. So, uh, it, it, you know, like I said, it's. Um, that's, that was really the impetus. Dan was the guy who made it happen. And I just went along for the ride. He, got, he brought the fighters in. The fighters made me look good. So, you know, it, 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 and it's never ended. And Dan eventually worked for you. Dan went to work for Bob Aaron at Top Rank during the early 90s. Bob began helping the Goosens out. And uh, so, of course, Dan passed away in. 2015, uh, was just inducted into the Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. The COVID bumped that off uh, for a couple of years. And, and um, you know, since then, Tom Brown, who the luckiest guy in the world, he married my sister. Uh, he's done a great job. He took over for Dan. Dan, Dan taught him well. Tom's a smart guy. He's a hard worker. Tom. Worked a lot with Bob and Bruce Trampler, the great Bruce Trampler, 
who knows everything about this game. So it, it's just been an incredible ride, and here we are standing here 40 years later from the time where I met Bob, and uh, it's incredible um, that we're here today, and I'm just so thankful to my brother for taking the initiative to build that ring that weekend, or else I don't think any of this would have happened. So, thank you, Dan. And congratulations to everyone on the panel. And by the way, Seth, I have to uh, thank you. You hired me in 1991 because Bob Aaron sent me to the TVKO audition. Again, Bob Aaron, behind the scenes helping people. And Seth uh, hired me. And uh, I had a great year working behind the mic at TVKO in 1991. Called some great fights. The first fight was Foreman Holyfield. And that's a hell of a way to, that was my first fight I ever announced. So, hey, so many great opportunities given to me by great men like this. And uh, I, I can't thank them enough. There's so many people I can't thank right now, but to uh, you men who really stir the, the drink here and make things happen, great men like you in this game, I'm very thankful for. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll move to the category of The Observer, defined as including print and media journalists, media executives and producers, publishers, writers, historians, record keepers, statisticians, photographers, artists, and screenwriters. In The Observer, Corey, we have the famed television executive, Seth Abraham. As a young ring announcer, Seth Abraham intimidated the heck out of me. One of the most powerful, influential, and innovative figures in boxing who built HBO into the powerhouse network of champions and synonymous with top quality programming on World Championship Boxing, Boxing After Dark, and TVKO. He began his career working for the New York Times and Major League Baseball before joining the upstart cable company called Home Box Office. This was in 1978, and he was the director of sport operations. He rose through the ranks and ultimately became president and CEO of Time Warner Sports, incorporating a storytelling element to broadcasts that distinguishes HBO, and known for negotiating deals with such boxing stars as Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Roy Jones Jr., Oscar De La Hoya, and Mike Tyson to compete on the networks, along with tireless negotiations with Don King and Bob Aaron. After departing HBO, he became executive president and COO of Madison Square Garden, and today he is recognized for his contributions to the sport of boxing. Congratulations to the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Fame inductee into the Observer category, Seth Abraham. as the patriarch of boxing, one of the most important figures in the history of the sport. Now just think about that. One of the most important figures in the history of professional boxing.
a good place to start them. With such a large group, I noticed that not one of them is a cut man. So I decided I should be careful with my words. Congratulations to all of the other Hall of Fame inductees, particularly Tim Ryan. I tried to hire Tim as a broadcaster 42 years ago to work HBO Boxing. Tim asked me who he would be replacing. I said I wanted Tim to replace perhaps the most famous, iconic, legendary boxing broadcaster of all time, Don Dunphy. Candidly, taking the microphone, the HBO microphone, away from Don should have permanently barred me from the Boxing Hall of Fame. A terrible decision. But I also didn't get Tim Ryan, which was a bad decision for HBO. It's also important to recognize millions, and I mean millions, in the HBO audience of subscribers whose loyalty and commitment to watch World Championship Boxing on HBO and the pay-per-view network TVKO made HBO the undisputed champion of television boxing for 30 years. From the early 1980s to the early 2000s, virtually every significant championship fight in boxing's glamour divisions, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, and heavyweight divisions were on HBO and TVKO. It's a string of over 100 championship title fights. Further evidence that HBO was boxing's TV king, I am the 13th HBO to be inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. That is more than any other organization. HBOs in the hall span 45 years of boxing history. Lou DiBello, Don Dunphy, Jim Lampley, Larry Merchant, Harold Letterman, Barry Tompkins, Bert Sugar, Emmanuel Stewart, George Foreman, Lennox Lewis, Roy Jones Jr., and Ray Leonard. I salute all of you. Today is a great honor for me, but the truth is, I'm here with the other 12 HBOers because of the great prize fighters who showcased their skills on HBO. Sluggers with colossal punching power. Dancers who flowed like liquid mercury. Ring generals who ruled the canvas like a battlefield. In the first draft of this, I named about 30 fighters. I decided as much as I want to honor them, your time is valuable. These are the fighters, plus countless scores of others, who put me on this stage today, and how they entertained fight fans around the world. I also want to thank Ed and his Hall of Fame staff, including Grace, for making this such a memorable weekend for my family and me. The acclaimed sports writer, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, Red Smith, wrote, the world's most famous historic buildings are the Vatican in Rome, the Colosseum in Rome, and Madison Square Garden in New York City. Two of those three were made famous by their boxing matches. Boxing fills history, and today, this place is the boxing capital of the world. Thank you. Our next inductee into the International Boxing Hall of Fame is one of the all-time great voices of boxing. In the Observer category, Tim Ryan. Seth had mentioned him, and certainly a man who is under such demand, one of the foremost commentators in his era, he had called over 300 championship fights during his career. 
Born in Winnipeg, Canada, a proud graduate of Notre Dame, he called boxing for NBC Sports from 1972 to 1977, before moving to CBS. At CBS, he served as a blow-by-blow -blow announcer and was paired with color commentator, analyst, and his longtime friend, Gil Clancy, to form one of the most respected teams in boxing broadcast history. Truly, the duo were synonymous with the sweet science to a generation of fans. His many classic calls include Ollie Frazier 1, Hearns vs. Leonard, Arguello vs. Pryor, Hagler vs. Leonard, and Hagler vs. Mugabe at Showtime's 1986 boxing debut. Additionally, he called 10 Olympic Games. He's highly regarded for his ability to tell the fighter's story and consistently <laughs> and concisely break down the ring action before the viewers. In the observatory, please welcome International Boxing Hall of Fame, Class of 2023, Tim Ryan. I get my notes out here, even though I used to be a professional, I like to have a script every now and then. <laughs> Well, it's obvious uh, I'm flattered and honored to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Those of you uh, old enough to remember my time covering this sport as a blow-by-blow -blow commentator during the golden years of boxing on TV in the 1980s, know that the star of our shows on CBS was Gil Clancy, a trainer of champions who became the best TV boxing analyst ever and is rightfully already honored here in the Hall. My start in the sport was with Mutual Radio calling a series of bouts in the early 70s. And that led to my radio broadcast of the historic Ali Frazier bout in 1971 to the Armed Forces Radio Network. That was a huge honor indeed. I was lucky enough to be chosen by NBC Sports at the start of the golden era of boxing on TV, sparked by the success of the American boxers at the 76 Olympic Games. Ray Leonard, Howard Davis, and the Sphinx Brothers. And when I moved to CBS in 1978, satellites were enabling sports to be televised live from venues around the world. And Bob Arum, mentioned again here, and Top Rank were pioneers in booking matches from Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America into weekend afternoon slots on US TV. Gil and I were lucky to cover more than 300 title fights featuring new stars like Roberto Duran, Riddick Bowe, they're here tonight as you know, Ray Mancini, Alexis Arguello, Hector Camacho, Tommy Hearns, Yaki Lopez, Aaron Pryor, and many, many more. Boxing creates, as you've heard here tonight, long, lifelong bonds for the people in the sport. The athletes themselves, trainers, managers, promoters, ring officials, all in a fraternity of a very special kind. I have many good friends already in the hall, some of whom, including Marvin Hagler, Angelo Dundee, writer Bud Schulberg, and artist Leroy Neiman, are no longer with us. Gratefully, my pals Al Bernstein, Barry Tompkins, and many more, along with Larry Merchant, still going strong. I'm sure that they're all as happy as I am that we've seen important advances in the sport. The growth of women's boxing, more safety concerns, more authority to referees, and the increased medical attention at ringside. And now we have seen even more coverage than ever of exciting young boxers on the scene, with cable TV and streaming pod and podcasts and websites, all of them devoted to the sport. But I think there should be just one world champion in each weight division. Sorry. All right, thank you. And I agree with Teddy Atlas that the sport can be improved with more oversight by neutral sources. Thanks to those media folks who brought me into such an illustrious company here in Canastota, and a personal thanks to a fan and friend of mine, Fred Sternberg, whom we should also be should also be in the hall as one of the sport's greatest publicists. I'd like to acknowledge my wife and some family members who made 
trips from various parts of the country to be here to join me on this very special weekend. It's a great honor. I'm in the greatest company in the sport of boxing here, and I thank all of them. We began our first inductee in the modern category is Laura Serrano. She is unable to be here with us this afternoon. More on that later. Now, there was a law established in 1947 forbidding women boxing in Mexico City. Our next inductee was instrumental in bringing that reversal of that ban, and she became Mexico's first female boxing champion. Born in Mexico City, she began boxing while studying law. In her professional debut, listen to this, she fought to a draw with Hall of Famer Christy Martin on the 1994 Revenge of the Rematches Supercard at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. In her second bout, consider this, she defeated Deirdre Gogarty for the vacant WIBF lightweight belt to become Mexico's first female boxing champion. During her 18-year career, she scored wins over Layla McCarter, Tracy Bird, Cynthia Prouder, Kelsey Jeffries, Chevelle Halbach, and Hall of Famer Alicia Ashley. She retired in 2012. Her impact in the sport truly extends beyond the ring. Not only a great boxer, but a credit to the sport in and out of the ring, and a true trailblazer. We congratulate the women's category, La Puente de Ring, Laura Serrano. Now we have a brief video. Laura has sent us a brief video in part explaining her absence in the Hall of Fame weekend. Good afternoon, everyone. Even though I'm not there to receive the honor and recognition from the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota, New York, I want to thank the President, Mr. Ed Buffer, and the board members for including my name in this anecdote. When I was notified about it, I was surprised and very happy. So I called my mom and my brothers. They were so very happy, but my mom was even very proud of her daughter. She said uh, she was happy and proud because I was the very first Mexican female fighter being honored in Minnesota. So she was so proud of me. And I humbly and respectfully accept this induction. I accept the honor uh, to belong to this city of Canasota, New York. And I'm sorry I'm not there. Uh, the reason why is because of my religious beliefs. I have always been uh, very consistent with my convictions. First as a fighter, now I was going to Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's why I'm they're celebrating with you, but from the bottom of my heart, I want to say to everyone responsible for my induction, I want to say thank you also to the fans. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Alicia Ashley was born in Kingston, Jamaica. She moved to the United States at the age of 11 with ambitious qualities and abilities to become a ballerina. She is with us here today and is our next inductee into the modern category. She even earned scholarships to prestigious dance schools, but as fate would have it, a knee injury at age 19 forced her to change paths and pursue boxing. As an amateur, she used those dancing skills, grace, poise, along with her tremendous athleticism to capture three Golden Gloves tournaments and two USA Nationals before turning pro at the age of 31, where she captured world titles as a featherweight, a bantamweight, and super bantamweight. She made history as the oldest woman to win the world championship at the impressive age of 48 years old. The Angels Wonder retired in 2018 at the age of 50, with a record includes wins over Kelsey Jeffries, Marcella Acuna, Elena Reed, and Alicia Graf. A true, a true. A true international star, 
She boxed in 13 countries, including Argentina, Austria, Germany, and North Korea, and now is the head boxing trainer at UFC Fit in Shanghai, China. The International Boxing Hall of Fame proudly welcomes to the class of 23-2023 in the women's category, ladies and gentlemen, originally from J J Kingston, Jamaica, now residing in Shanghai, China, with a record of 24 wins, 12 losses, one draw, with four wins, coming by a way of knockout, a holder of six world championship titles, the two China super bantamweight world champion, three division world champion, the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Famer, Alicia Snake Ashley. essentially means to advance a career despite a massive failure. That in our life's journey, we encounter challenges that shock us off our previous path and out of our com comfort zone and change the trajectory of your life. And that's essentially, essentially what happened to mine. In the first third of my life, I trained I'm a, a professional dancer, um, like my father. And in the midst of achieving my dream, I had a devastating injury, which curtailed that future. It took me a while to pivot, but eventually I fell into boxing. At no point did I uh, think that I would have a career in boxing, especially the route that I took. I started boxing at age 28 and turned pro at 32. And no promoter would take a chance on me because I am starting my career when majority of fighters are actually finishing theirs. They never expected my career to last two years, much less, you know, almost 20. So even though I took an unconventional route, I'm basically the only path that was open to me. You know, I traveled the world, was the underdog in most of my fights, even when I was a champion. And I fought practically every place before being able to even fight in my own hometown, uh, in New York City. I still haven't fought in Jamaica well, yet now, but... <laughs> right. A lot of people may look at my record on paper and without context would actually wonder how I got here. But in doing that, they're missing the bigger picture. As, they, as that made me realize that uh, I've been shortchanging myself in, and limiting in my thinking of that I fell upwards. The road that I took to get here for me, it was akin to climbing Mount Everest. There are twists and turns along the way, be it ageism, sexism, or the hostile territories with limited support. I had to work two, three times as hard and pushed and persevered through injuries, disappointments, lack of monetary finances, working full time going to school part-time to get my bachelor's and training sometimes uh, twice a day. But eventually, I was able to get this professional career that started extremely late, but lasted 18 years. Not having opportunities now open to women but creating my own path, I might not have initially chosen this profession, but I damn well earned it. Yeah. I can't imagine what the road would have been if I started out with a promoter and a manager, 
uh, probably a lot more opportunities, a lot less losses, <laughs> but also a lot less of the uh, eclectic experiences that I've encountered and less work world traveling, which I totally enjoy. Um, but I guess that path would still have brought me here. I've always had a growth, growth mindset with uh, that every fight was working towards a goal. There are steps to su success, to becoming a better, to becoming better each time, more so than to ultimately win titles. I never got into this game really to win titles. For me, I was just a competitor and I enjoyed boxing and it was just to become a better fighter. I want to take this time to thank the people that were instrumental in helping me along the way, starting with my oldest and brother and first trainer, Devon Cormack. <laughs> For the longest time, he tried to get me into martial arts, which I had no interest in. And I guess he saw something in me, uh, probably my stubbornness, my competitiveness, tenacity, and that, that probably came from the fact that I was the youngest and I had to follow all my oldest brother around. Well, they had to take care of me, so. I was on all their adventures and they knew that they couldn't leave me behind. Getting this solid foundation made a world of difference for any fighter and especially for me. To all uh, my boxing coaches, actually I have to take this chance to acknowledge Hector Roca who passed away this year. He was an excellent corner man for all of my major fights. All of my boxing coaches in my later years have helped me diversify my style. Anyone who's watched me fight knows where the moniker Slick comes along, but in my later years, when uh, my injuries started becoming too much to overcome, my husband and strength coach, Matthew, knew that once that mobility was compromised, he helped me kind of work on sitting on my punches and getting my punching power going. So, thank you. <laughs> Luigi Olchesi, who became my manager 10 years into my career, he helped me he was very instrumental in me being able to fight in New York City and eventually position me to win my crowning achievements, my WBC titles, and subsequently my Guinness World Record titles. No words. For which one was, of course, being the oldest female to win a world championship. And the second was to become the oldest person, male or female, to win that world championship title. <laughs> to all the sisterhood in boxing, the women who will, were willing to get better by sparring with each other. I have a couple here today with me. I had some of the best sparring partners, especially at Gleason's gym. It was a haven for female fighters. And um, I'd like to thank all of you women for being there, uh, helping me along the way. To so all my competitors, win or loss, who helped make me a better champion, that support was invaluable. But most of all, to my Jamaican parents, Thelma and Frank, my late grandmother, and my uncle Earl, who all raised me and instilled in me the dedication and willingness to go up and beyond what is needed to achieve my dream. My dream. I have a rock star of a mother. She refused to see me fight never went to any of my fights. 
but she always gave her full support in every other way possible. She, as a single mother, gave up a lot of, to physically raise us in order to give us a better life here in the USA. I had a perfect role model in this strong Jamaican woman. Thanks, Mom. I keep stressing Jamaican because I'm proud to be only the second Jamaican and the first woman, uh, first woman to represent my little island by being inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. So finally, I wanted to thank the International Boxing Hall of Fame, all the members, the boxing community, and everyone who voted. They look past the numbers on paper to the body of my work and the risks, the, the risks that I took, the quality of people that I fought, and gave me this lasting honor. Um, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. I'm deeply honored, blessed, and awe-inspired to be placed among some of my favorite but of all time fighters. Being inducted into the Hall of Fame is a one with a wonderful cast of people. And I've always hated to say this word, but it's surreal. And it continues to surprise me. And sometimes I wonder, you know, I'll wake up and see that this is all a dream. So thank you, everyone. Rafael Marquez hails from Mexico City, Mexico. Under the guidance of Hall of Fame trainer Nacho Vega Stang, he won the World Championship in two weight divisions. He captured the IBF and the IBO bantamweight titles, and then the lineal WBC, the Ring Super Bantamweight World Championships. He engaged in an epic, unforgettable four-fight series with Israel Vasquez, with a second and third bounce earning Fight of the Year awards for 2007 and 2008, respectively. The rivalry continued, even up two and two, with Marquez scoring an empathic victory third round knockout in their fourth bout in 2010. He retired in 2013 with a record of 41 wins, nine losses, 37 knockouts, and wins over Tim Austin, Mauricio Pastrana, Silence Mabusa, and Hall of Famer Mark Too Sharp Johnson. In the modern category, ladies and gentlemen, the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Famer from Mexico City, Mexico, La Ciudad de Mexico, with a record of 41 wins, 9 losses, 37 big wins coming by way of knockout, demos la bienvenida a dos veces campeón mundial, the two-time two-division champion of the world, Rafael Marquez. Muchas gracias a todos. Es un gusto estar aquí con todos ustedes, con este, empresarios. Creo que es muy importante eh, estar aquí. Good evening. It's a pleasure to all of you and everybody here to, to be here today. Y es el sacrificio de 30 años que hemos trabajado y hemos hecho en este deporte que es muy duro, pero muy bonito. It is a sacrifice of 30 years to be able to achieve this here today, which is very difficult, but beautiful as well. No, y gracias a mis padres, a mi madre, a mis hermanos que siempre estuvieron con nosotros en el apoyo día tras día. And of course, thank you to my mother, my father, which are here today, my sisters, which all supported me throughout all these years. Y algo muy importante, mis hijos, Aaron, Ángel, Israel Márquez, que fueron parte de esa historia, y mi esposa, eso es dedicado a todos ellos y a todo México. And of course, most of all to my children, my wife, and all of Mexico. Thank you. Y muchas gracias a todos ustedes por aquí. Muy amable. Thank you to all of you here. Everything 
Bradley should be a part of the audience of every great event. He is so enthusiastic, it's just unbelievably great. Our next inductee in the modern category, Carl Froch hails from Nottingham, England. Following a spectacular amateur career, he turned professional in 2002 and soon after captured the British Boxing Board of Control and Commonwealth Super Middleweight Belts, along with the hearts and hopes of boxing fans across the UK. On the world stage, he won the WBC, IBF, and WBA versions of the Super Middleweight Championship four times. Four times indeed. He holds wins over world champions Jean Pasquale, Andre Durrell, Arthur Abraham, Glenn Johnson, Lucien Boutte, and Mikael Kessler, along with George Groves. And who can forget his spectacular and dramatic 12th round knockout win over Jermaine Taylor with 14 seconds left in the fight. He was invited to participate in the gathering of the greatest active super middleweights <coughs> in the world and advanced to the finals of the Super 6 World Boxing Classic Super Middleweight Tournament in a showdown against Andre Ward. Following a knockout, knockout victory over George, over George Groves in front of 80,000 fans in Wembley Stadium, he retired as the unified super middleweight champion of the world in 2014 with a record of 33 wins, two losses with 24 knockouts. In 2015, he was awarded the third highest ranking Order of the British Empire Award, the MBE by Queen Elizabeth. Today he is awarded invitation to boxing's highest honor of membership into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, a modern category. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2023 class of the International Boxing Hall of Fame from Nottingham, England with a record of 33 wins, 2 losses, 24 knockouts, one of England's and boxing's all-time greats. The four-time super middleweight champion of the world, Carl the Cobra Crouch. Can you imagine being able to speak like that? Just wonderful the flow. <laughs> Thank you for this room, by the way. Masterpiece. Right, what I was going to do was, I was going to get up here today and try and wing it like David Brent in the office. But I realise this is serious business, international boxing on the same side. And Timothy Bradley being a consummate professional, I'm watching him in the back there, like pre flight ritual, getting nervous, reading his notes, tapping away. I'm like, God damn, I've got to do something here. So I've made some notes. But you'll have to excuse me, so I don't like to, um, I don't like to read notes because I just like to talk. And for those of you who don't know me, I've been talking a bit as well. Sometimes too much. Well, I'm just going to read this because this is from the heart. This took me, it didn't take me long about there, but it's, it's from many thoughts on the plane journey over. So here I go. First of all, I want to thank my mother, Carol, for, for being my number one fan and always doing the best for her three boys. I've got an older brother and a younger brother, Liam Wade. She's a wonderful, strong woman. I know we'll lean on her even now, at times, in the hard times for strength. It was my dad who got me into boxing when I was eight years old. But I didn't see much of him growing up, so I never really had a, a positive male role model as a child. And that's one of the reasons I think why I um, gravitated towards boxing. I loved it in the gyms. My, my amateur coach, Dan McPhilbin, he did a great job with me, he really did. I won two national titles. Uh, numerous medals in multi nations tournaments for, for England, representing my country, England. And um, my, my biggest accolade in the amateur championships was the world, the world amateur championships in Belfast. I won a bronze medal there. I lost the, uh, lost the Russian world champion in the semi final. I thought, I thought I could beat him, but four too many rounds wasn't long enough. So I came away with a bronze medal in the world amateur championships, and uh, that's where my journey actually as a professional started because I met my coach. Rob McCracken at the Worlds in Ireland in 2001 in Belfast. Um, he said to me, you would make a great professional fighter. I, I didn't really believe him, but he could see something in me that, that he thought could transcend into the professional rankings. And without Rob McCracken, I would have never turned professional. Absolutely no chance to turn <laughs> And Rob, Rob probably never knew this, but... Um, 
He was like a big brother, a father, and a best friend all rolled into one. And um, together we conquered the world. We really did. Twice they did. Twice the BBC champion. That's the great junior man, junior pointer. IBF title and the WBA. <laughs> yeah. The three major belts in the business. Um, it, it was one hell of a journey as well. My first world title fight against the superb John Pascal was in Nottingham, in my hometown in front of 8,000 fans. I used this line yesterday and I didn't get a big enough response, so you all better listen up. 8,000 fans in Nottingham for my first world title fight. Now that's not a big time, that's not a big one. And my last fight was at the National Stadium, the Wembley Stadium, in front of 80,000 fans. I don't mention it much. <laughs> After that massive win and what was the country's biggest grudge match in ages, I mean, Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, that was, that was a lot of beef, a lot of needle in that fight, but this, this was a genuine grudge match. After that, um, I decided that was it for me. I decided that, that was the, um, that was a crest of the wave that I was going to retire on with four world titles. Now, I could talk for hours about the fights. I've had an amazing run of 12 world title fights back to back, fighting the best of the best in the division. And I didn't win them all, 32, 33 wins. 33 wins? 33, 33 wins. Uh, consummate professional. It was, yeah, we've got That's actually worth pointing out. We, we've got the same record, and he won his world title in my hometown, Lygon. Um, just amazing, and we, we're both straight towards the line in the punditry game. We're both, we're both tied out here. We don't mind upsetting people in the, for the <laughs> sake of being honest. <laughs> so, split two wins, split three wins, two losses. One of the losses was a Vems, actually. I thought Mikel Kessler had a great game in a rematch. But the O2, the O2 in London, uh, the O2 Arena in London. There was only 20,000 people there that night, but it's a <laughs> It's a night I will never forget. Like, like I said, I didn't win them all. But what I never did was quit. Champions, world champions don't quit. And quitters do not get inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Thank you to everyone involved for having me. Thank you for selecting me for this prestigious accolade. I've had, the, I've had an amazing time I have. I've mixed with some amazing people, legends in the game, people I never thought I'd meet. Uh, boxing Royals are great. Um, surrounded by yesterday at the, at the venue. It was just amazing to look around with some of the greats. And um, I'm going to fly back to England tomorrow. I'm going to step foot on UK soil. I will be the proudest man in the West because of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our final inductee into the International Boxing Hall of Fame last had a fantasy fight in a matchup against Roberto Duran just last night. But I didn't quit. I didn't quit. Haley from Palm Springs, California, Timothy Bradley Jr. He competed in 140 amateur bouts before he turned professional, where he eventually captured the WBC Super Lightweight World Title twice and the WBO Championship in the one to weight division once. But that was just the start to his fabulous career. He became a two division world champion, moving to the welterweight division to capture that WBO strap from boxing legend Manny Pacquiao, and then successfully defending against Ruslan Provodnikov in 2013's Fight of the Year, as well as a successful defense against Hall of Famer Juan Manuel Marquez. He regained the title in 2015 before hanging up the gloves in 2016. After taking on a veritable who's who of boxing with a record of only two blemishes in his stellar career. Holy wins over boxing world champions, junior winner Kendall Holt, Lamont Peterson, Joel Casamayor, Devin Alexander, Jesse Vargas, and Brandon Rios. Now he provides expert insight from ringside as the popular commentator on Top Ranks ESPN boxing telecasts. Ladies and gentlemen, in the modern category, 
Here is the 2023 International Boxing Hall of Famer, the two-division world champion from Palm Springs, California, with a record of 33 wins, two losses, one draw, and one no contest. He has 13 wins, coming by way of knockout. Please welcome the former super lightweight and welterweight champion of the world, the Desert Storm, Timothy Tears of joy, and it's okay to cry for your family, your loved ones. Um, I miss this part. Getting something like this so valuable to me, close to my heart. I want to hand this to my wife. It was like uh, me handing over that check at the end of the night. <laughs> so I'm gonna hand this over so she can keep this nice and safe in her pus. Give me just a second. Beautiful children, Robert, Malaysia, Jada, Malaya, and Malachi. My father, Timothy Bradley Sr., my mother, Kathleen Bradley, my two sisters, they're not here right now, but Shate and Maisha, you guys in my heart, I love you guys. My uncle Sam Jackson, standing over here, sitting over here. Uh, my in-laws, Raina, thank you for coming. Uh, Gustavo Monzo, Gustavo Monzo, excuse me. Uh, my brother-in-law, my right-hand man, uh, Big Chris. Thank you for being here, baby. I love you. Um, my first trainers, Russell Rodriguez, OJ Kucher, John Kucher. May they rest in peace. Love you guys. Thank you so much for introducing me to the sport and showing me the sweet science of boxing. Ted Walls, another one of my trainers. Rest in peace. Um, Coach Sergeant Michael Klein, Al Mitchell. Larry Nicholson, one of the best trainers in the world, Joel Diaz, the one that got me my five world championships. We did it, baby, thank you, and I wish you were here with me. Um, my strength and conditioning coach, Coach Rusley, he's at home, he's bonded to a wheelchair, he had a massive stroke. Um, I'm with him in spirit, I love you, Coach Rusley, thank you so much for all the time you spent with me on the track. Um, my doctors, <laughs> believe it or not, I had doctors. Dr. Ayub, I love you. He was the craziest doctor in the world, but I still love you. <laughs> Dr. Maria Elena, uh, Dr. Steven Livingston, my, my Frank Gustafsson, oh, excuse me, Frank Gustafsson, my physical therapist, uh, my first promoter, Thompson Boxing Promotions, the man that built me from the ground up in my career, Alex Capanova. I want to thank him. Mr. Ken Thompson, who I believe gave me, who actually thought that I would get here. The first day he watched me, he said I would be a Hall of Fame fighter, no doubt about it in his eyes. And may he rest in peace. Um, Gary Shaw Promotions, uh, Kamara Mercer, Lee Bates, my boss, Michael Quaid, who gave me, I think, the second best advice that I ever got in my life, be yourself. Um, My brother, Joel Rosas, thank you for being here and thank you for your mentorship over the years. Really appreciate that. Uh, top rank family, the best promoter in boxing, Bob Barron, Mr. Bob Barron, no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. No offense to any other promoters either, but I'm just saying, be the best, the go. Todd DeBuff, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, believing in my wife. You know, it's really, this business is tough for for a woman, you know, this is a man's world, it really is. And, you know, Tom DeBuff, 
uh, work closely with my wife in, in, in helping guide my career and, and, and negotiating the contracts and things like that. So I thank him for that. And, um, you know, also for giving me an opportunity to be on ESPN as well. That was, that was part of my exit plan and retiring. And he said, hey, Tim, I can give you the opportunity, but you got to keep the door open. And so I had to go to work <laughs> to be able to maintain and stay on ESPN. Um, Lee Sanders, um, Paul Moretti, these are all my guys, man. These are all my guys. Bruce Trampler, Brad Goodman, Christina Poncher and her husband, Jermaine, Ciara, Mikey, Juan, uh, Katie, Derek, Angie, my whole, the ESPN family, my colleagues, Mark Kriegel that made it down. He gonna be in here too one day. No doubt about it, Mark Kriegel. Phenomenal. Joe Tessitore, Mario Asuna, Andre World War, Teddy Atlas and his family, Showtime. Thank you so much for, for airing my skills, my talent, HBO, the WBO, love you guys, the WBC and all the boxing writers and all of my adversaries that I shared the ring with. Thank you, I love you guys. This is you guys are the reason why I'm here. Um, and Ed Brophy, thank you. This has been a fantastic event, man. Honestly, you guys do a great job. All the volunteers, everyone involved. It is unbelievable. And they make it so memorable for you. And also the people here in Catastota, thank you so much. These are the best fans in the world. They say England got the best fans in the world. I don't think so, dog. I think I think got you. So, yeah. Anyways, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and other prestigious honorees. It is an incredible honor and a privilege to stand before you today as I get inducted into the 20, 2023 Boxing Hall of Fame. I am humbled and grateful for this recognition. I sincerely thank the Selection Committee, my family, my friends, my fans, who have been riding with me all these years. I didn't get here because I was better than everyone I fought. I got here because I wanted it more than everyone. The pain, tears, sweat, sacrifice, and suffering possessed me to succeed. But those tears and suffering had very little to do with boxing, the sport of boxing. The tears I shed were on my pillow many nights. And the suffering I endured was overwhelming but needed. I could never forget the day my wife and I walked up to an eviction notice on our home, our family home. And my wife and I, and I also remember when my wife and I had, had no extra money to give our daughter Alicia a birthday party. Or the time when the transmission went out on the car and the compressor went out on the refrigerator simultaneously and the rent was due. And I had to swallow my pride and ask my brother-in-law, my right-hand man, to let me hold something. You know what that means? That means let me get some money, let me hold something. Can you help me out until I get paid? I love you for that, Chris, thank you. There was so much uncertainty and struggle but in moments of need and support, thanks to loyal and loving men, like my man, Sam Jackson over here, the only man that can stay in the room with me, nobody else can stay in the room with me the week of the fight, only Sam, he was my mentor, he was my best buddy, he was like my uncle, um, like I never had. Um, always supportive, always stood by my side and always believed in me, and I thank you, Sam, appreciate you, appreciate you. I'm trying to keep it together, Malachi. I'm trying to keep it together. Malachi's my son. Jackson also, he allowed me, during my hard times, he allowed me to personal train some of his, his clients that he had. He did personal training on the side just so I could put gas in my car. That's what type of man he is. You know, and something that small, you know, it goes a long way. It had a huge imp impact on my life and I'm forever grateful for him. You know, every honest man knows the pressure of providing for his family and his wife looking at him like, what are we gonna do? You either become suffocated by it all or you fight hard to get back onto your feet. That same pressure came 
Ian Heavy on May 10th, 2008 in England. The early morning before my battle with Junior Witter, later that evening, I remember my wife getting to the hotel around 4 a.m. At first glance, I heard, Tim, Tim. This Tim was, this Tim had pain and worry, concern. He wasn't like a hello Tim. I knew something was up. And she said, we only have $11 in our bank account. I spent our last $300 to get here. You must win. <laughs> you gotta win. I told her, I looked at her, I said, I'm gonna win. And that day I vowed that my family would never be broke again. In every fight after that championship, these hardships stayed in my heart and in my mind, fueling me and giving me an edge because I wasn't the most talented out there. Still, I was the hungriest. Five world championships, five beautiful children. My focus and career became all about you. All of you sit right here. My wife sacrificed and suffered just as just as much as I did. And Monica, I know you felt every single punch I took, but I am forever grateful you are still standing beside me through it all. I love you and our five beautiful children, Robert, Malaysia, Jaden, Malaya, and Malachi. Thank you for inspiring me to become something more than myself, the Desert Storm. However, I didn't become this ferocious five, six, beast <laughs> without my creators, my parents, my father, Timothy Ray Bradley Sr. and my mother, Kathleen Bradley. I was born and raised in North Palm Springs in a neighborhood where gangs, gun violence, drugs, and prostitution existed, which devoured many souls, some family members and friends also. Although we lived in the ghetto in the midst of evil, my parents devoted their lives to keeping my sisters, Shantae, Maisha and myself off the streets and out of danger. You know, the odd thing is, these were the same streets I walked, played, rode bikes on, and occasionally fought on. The same streets, these same streets hardened me and made me mean and aggressive simultaneously because I'll be damned if someone was gonna bully me. You see, it's easy for a child to become a product of his environment, but what they don't tell you is that you can be a different product generated within that environment, but it all starts at home with the parents. I remember the words loud and clear from my father telling me that drug money is only momentary and that earned money can last your lifetime. I remember my mother introducing God into our life at an early age, and I remember attending Sunday school, choir practice, usher practice, vacation Bible school. I mean, I did it all. <laughs> my mother knew the importance of instilling God's love in our hearts. Thank you so much, Mom, for your unconditional love. I can recall my father, he worked 365 days a year, even on Christmas, and never once complained. My father was a champion in my eyes, well before I was. He was my hero, and he was the first example of what greatness is in my life. My father inspired me to be the best at everything I do. He instilled behavior principles in me starting at a young age. I was five when my father first challenged me after I told him I wanted a motorcycle for Christmas. He told me I didn't, he didn't believe that I was strong enough to handle a motorcycle. So he insisted on me doing 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups for him every day after he came home from work. And I had to do it for an entire year. Well, I never totaled it, totaled it up, but I have now. So I did three 
35,900 push-ups and 35,900 sit-ups in a year. My goodness, I must have been the strongest six-year-old in, in America. I'm telling you, I was a freak. <laughs> My father was a genius, you see. The words, I can, were the motivation. And I must do was the work that my father instilled in me. To get where I'm at today, I had to work hard, sacrifice and suffer more than everyone. My motivation from my father never stopped. He would use phrases like, I know I don't smell something. I know I don't smell something. I mean, I remember getting up early in the morning on tracks, on the track and my father would ask me, do you see anybody else out here? No, I don't know. You know, you see the old man, he always out here, he always out here getting his mouth saying, did you see anybody else out here with you? Your age? I said, no, no. He goes, you're right, you're right. But that don't mean that somebody on the other side of the globe, your age right now, is doing the same thing you doing right now. He was right. And my man, give me one second, I'm sorry. <laughs> you see, my father had a way of breaking me down mentally and physically and then building me up. And without his lessons and not just teaching, but showing me how to be a man, I will not be standing here today. This honor is for you just as well as it is for me, Dad. The name, our name, Timothy Bradley will live forever. <laughs> However, another memory that I remember, that I remember, I will never forget when I got a little uh, froggy with my mother one day, and I flew up a chest up at her, I was 15 years old. That was the day I realized that I got my power from my dad. <laughs> my punching power. <laughs> my mom was and still is the only person to put me down with a body shot. <laughs> my mother was just as strict as my father, <laughs> if not more challenging. She never begged me or questioned my father about any of the crazy training methods he had me doing. Like, I mean, I've never been to jail before, but I'm in handcuffs while sparring. <laughs> and my father even told me to go get a rock out of the desert so he can drop it on my stomach like a medicine ball. He's even promised to run me over if I let go of the car when, I told, when he told me to grab onto it while I was running. Dad and Mom, thank you for all the support over the years. I thank God for you to be able to witness this, the start and the ending. And Dad, you remember our first day we walked into the gym? Coach OJ, the gym owner, he got in the seat after my dad had handed him the clipboard, after my dad filled out the application. And he said, let me go away, you kid. So he gets up out of his chair, and as I'm walking, there's a scale off to the right as you walk out of the, the, out of the office. And he walks over, and I'm following behind him, kind of close. He turns around real quick, and he pushes me back like this because I was up on him. And he feels on my chest, and I'm like, man, what is he feeling for? Is he feeling for, feeling for hair on my chest? What is he doing? I'm looking at my father, like, what's going on? Why is this old man feeling up on my chest like this? And he said, looking in my eyes, he said, you different. And my dad was like, huh? He's like, no, oh, I see. I've been around this sport a long time. I've seen the greats. You different. Yep. Anyways, let me finish my story. <laughs>
I love it. All right, got it. And so OJ said, you different. He's like, you're going to be a champion. And he was right. But OJ forgot one thing. He forgot to say I was going to be a Hall of Famer. Thank you very much for your time.